Hey, Kurt Pappy coming to you with another gear review video. Today's video is going to be a little different than my normal format. Normally I drill down deeply into one piece of gear, but since I spent uh, a fair amount of time on the Superior Trail last month, it kind of took me back in time a little bit, and I thought what might be useful is for me to go over today the pieces of gear that have withstood the test of time, some of which actually uh, came along with me on my Superior hiking trail trips uh, 15 years ago. Over the last dozen years or so, I've tested about uh, 100 pieces of gear for a backpacking gear test. You'd think some of these items would have made it on the list, but only one or two have, so uh, kind of surprising, but uh, that's how things worked out. So without further ado, uh, here's my list of uh, my items that have withstood the test of time. They've had lots of ruck. First up on my list is uh, my jet boil. If you haven't seen it, I've actually got a, uh, a video, kind of uh, my attempt at humor about my, my love of my jet boil. But this is my original jet boil that I bought in, I believe, 2006. So it's about 14 years old. It's uh, a little bit the worse for wear. The cup doesn't hold on quite as well as it used to. I've had to replace the igniter on here. The weakest link on the jet boil is the igniter. The good news is jet boil has kept their newer models backwards compatible in terms terms of the geometry of the igniter. So a brand new igniter uh, that you buy uh, from the store online or, or REI is going to fit a modern day jet boil and this 14 year old jet boil. I've tested a lot of stoves for backpack gear test over the years. I've tested alcohol stoves. I've tested wood stoves, I've tested canister stoves, and, I, and when I was winter backpacking uh, in Minnesota, I used white gas stoves, MSR white gas stoves, so I've, I've used them all. Um, but on trips, I just naturally go back to my jet boil. And the reason is, is it's, it's been very reliable, it's very compact, uh, it all fits in this one little, nice little container here, including the fuel. Everything uh, fits right in this little container, which I put into this little stuff sack here. The stuff sack, uh, especially since I keep my jet boil on the outside of my pack in a uh, side pocket. And one of the problems I had over the years is pieces would fall off, the lid would fall off, or pop open and the, uh, the French press attachment would fall on the ground and I lose one of the stems. This, by the way, I think is my third French press attachment. Uh, as I said, uh, it's very easy to lose the stems on this guy. So I keep the whole French press, the screen and the two stems, uh, in a tiny little Ziploc bag inside this little stuff sack which also contains a lighter just in case since the igniter is the weak point of the system. I always, and you always carry a lighter with you anyway to start a campfire or if somebody needs a lighter for another stove or something like that. So that goes in there and then my spork goes in there and then my jet boil goes in there. This is a, a little Sea to Summit uh, uh, dry bag. This all zips up and this way I've got everything I need to make a meal right in the bag and it goes right in the side pocket of my, of my backpack. And if it falls out and falls on the ground, I, I'm not going to lose any of the pieces. And that's been very important because like I said, I've lost pieces to the French press attachment over the years. The other thing I like about the jet boil, I really like, uh, as opposed to the other canister stoves, that I've tested and used over the years. It's very fuel efficient, of course. That's uh, what Jet Boil is known for with the heat exchanger. But also the neoprene sleeve on the outside uh, does a great job of uh, keeping me from burning my fingers. I've used alcohol stoves plenty of times. Every time I use an alcohol stove, I seem to burn my fingers somehow. Uh, and this guy with a neoprene sleeve makes sure I never burn my fingers. So uh, it works really well for that. 
Uh, I love the French press coffee attachment. Makes great coffee. You really don't need a whole coffee pot. You just take this little French press attachment with you uh, and it slides down on the inside and bingo, you've got a, you've got a coffee maker. So my French press is probably my, one of my oldest and my most uh, beloved pieces of camping gear in my whole repertoire. So the jet boil. Next up is my uh, 200 weight polar fleece. This one happens to be uh, an LL Bean. I believe I bought this in 2007, very latest 2008. I went back to my records and I couldn't figure it out. I really like this polar fleece. It's a pullover. It does not have a zipper that fails. Uh, however, over the last dozen or so years, uh, some of the snaps have come off the inside. Um, but this thing is super warm even when wet. When I used to hike the border route on the Superior Trail, um, this, this was my main insulation layer. I didn't really carry a down puffy. And the nice thing about polar fleece is if it gets a little wet or soggy, it still keeps you warm. And these things are indestructible. The other nice thing about them is uh, if you wear them at night, uh, they don't compress. If you wear a down jacket or a down puffy at night, your back or your side, uh, whatever side you're going to sleep on, that down is going to compress and that side of you is going to get cold. Whereas if you wear a nice polar fleece layer like this, um, you'll stay nice and toasty. This particular one is uh, an L.L. Bean. People don't talk a lot about L.L. Bean, but I actually buy a lot of my clothing from them because they carry a tall size. Uh, I'm six foot four, and uh, so a regular, if I go to Target or REI or something like that, most of the, the tops, the jackets and so on, don't fit me very well. They're just too short-waisted. Uh, but this L.L. Bean fleece is a uh, large tall and it fits me just to a T. Uh, I'm not going to put it on right now because it's almost 100 degrees here in Tucson. Uh, that would be a little too toasty, but uh, this thing really has kept me warm over the years. My L.L. Bean 200 weight polar fleece. Next up is my uh, ULA Ohm 2.0 backpack, which I bought in 2013. So this one is uh, seven years old now. It's very lightweight. It's about two pounds and it's big enough for about a three to four day trip. Anything longer than that and I use my catalyst. Uh, but it's amazing that in a two pound backpack can, can carry enough gear to keep me going for three or four days. It's lightweight. It holds tons of gear for a small pack. Um, makes good use of the space. It's got this great big front pocket here. It's got these fantastic uh, hip belt pockets where I keep the things that I need to use during the day. It's got nice big side pockets. Uh, it's got the hooks in the front where I hang my water bottles. So uh, this guy just holds a ton of stuff. Uh, this is a roll top design. And uh, one of the things I like about the roll top is I can tuck things under the strap that holds the roll top down. So sometimes uh, if I need the space, I'll carry things like my mat under the roll top. Uh, or I, you can put a sleeping bag or a food bag or something like that under this strap here and it's held very securely. I love this pack. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of my very oldest and it's my default pack. I try to take this on every single backpacking trip I go on and uh, it's held up very, very well over the years. ULA Ohm 2.0 backpack. Next up are my REI Sahara convertible pants. I have about four pairs of these, I think. And uh, this, this pair in kind of the sand color is the one I use the most often. They're really nice. They're convertible, so I can just open them up uh, a little bit here to vent, or I can take the bottoms off completely. The zippers are color-coded, so you don't have to guess which side they go back on. They're really lightweight, almost too lightweight. They keep me warm on cooler mornings, but they're lightweight enough nylon that they dry almost instantaneously on river crossings. Um, they will dry within a half an hour to an hour or so, depending upon the, the humidity and temperature and so on. 
Uh, they got nice big uh, cargo pockets for me to put stuff in. Uh, and these hold up uh, pretty well. Uh, the major downside of them is the seams here do have a tendency to uh, tear out in the crotch. Uh, I'm not going to show you a close-up of that, but uh, the seams can tear out. And eventually, uh, if you do a fair amount of battage, if you do any sliding on your butt down rock faces or anything like that, um, it will wear through on the, on the butt. Um, the pockets or whatever will actually wear through. I've probably bought seven or eight pairs of these over the years. I still have about four of them, so I've thrown maybe three pairs uh, away where they've just gotten so bad that they haven't been usable anymore. But one of the things to keep in mind, these are kind of commodity items for REI, and um, so they're, they're kind of spendy. Um, if you don't buy them on sale, but once or twice a year, they will go on sale for 30 or 40 percent off. Stock up, buy a couple pair uh, when they're on sale, and then they're a very reasonably priced piece of uh, clothing. So, REI Sahara convertible pants, made out of nylon, great stuff. Next up is uh, another REI piece of gear. Uh, this is my. 32 degree Fahrenheit uh, down mummy bag that I bought in 2005 or 2006, I believe. So this is close to 15 years old. Uh, I've had to wash it a couple times so uh, the down doesn't have quite as much loft as it did when I first bought it. But uh, the nice thing about this, if you're just starting out or you just want to buy your first uh, down sleeping bag, uh, something in the 30, 32 degree range is really optimal. Uh, most of the time uh, it's tough for mother nature to get down below the freezing point because it takes all that extra energy to change the, the, the moisture in the air from water into ice. So uh, it's very, uh, very common to get t nighttime temperatures right around 32 degrees. So having a 32 degree bag is just spot on. I still use this bag. I just used it uh, uh, a week or two ago at a camp out here in Arizona where it uh, got down into the 40s at night. Uh, it's, a, it's a mummy bag so it fits over your head. But um, one of the nice things about buying uh, down from REI uh, is that it is a very good value for the dollar. Uh, not the highest quality. You can go out there and go to Feathered Friends or all these different places and uh, uh, get much higher quality down than REI. Um, but in terms of bang for the buck, it's, it's pretty tough to beat some of these uh, commodity sleeping bags and quilts that uh, REI carries. So uh, I still use this all the time. Uh, it's one of my go-to pieces of gear, my REI 32 degree Sahara uh, down mummy bag. Next up is uh, something I wouldn't have thought of uh, five years ago, um, but I bought this little, I've, I've had a Thermarest sleeping mat uh, for years, one of these uh, Z-Fold foam sleeping pads, and uh, I bought this sit pad to use uh, just, you know, when I'm sitting down, more to keep my butt dry than anything else. Um, but it also feels pretty darn good when you're sitting on a rock or whatever. Uh, what I didn't expect is all the other uses I would find for this. Uh, I put it outside my tent or my, my hammock at night so that when I get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, I'm stepping down onto a dry, clean surface so that my feet or my socks uh, don't get dirty before I put on my my night shoes, my, uh, my shoes or my sandals or uh, my flip-flops or whatever I'm wearing during the night. So it makes a really nice uh, entryway clean spot. The other thing I do with it is I use it just inside of my tent. What I find, I'm getting older now, I'm 67 years old, and uh, my knees need a little uh, tender loving care. And I find if I put this pad right on the inside of my tent, I can kneel down, get in my tent, 
uh, sit down and when you're putting your knees down on, on just the tent floor, if there's rocks or gravel or something sharp underneath, it can really dig into your kneecap. And so this uh, really saves my kneecaps and probably my, the floor of my tent from getting punctured from those sharp rocks that we have a lot of here in Arizona. And then as soon as I'm in my tent, I can just reach around and put it outside so that uh, it's now my, my nice and dry and clean spot as I, if I need to get up during the night. So uh, this thing weighs next to nothing, just tucks into a pocket uh, in, my, in my backpack, use it all the time, um, great little device. Next up are my platypus uh, water bottles with the built-in carabiner. One of the nice things about the Platypus soft-sided water bottles is they, they weigh little of nothing. They're also very sturdy, they don't leak. Uh, there's a little capture on here to make sure that the top doesn't accidentally pop open. And uh, the reason I like to use these is uh, I can open them up, I don't have my backpack on at the moment, and just take a drink from there uh, without actually taking it off my, my shoulder harness on my backpack. So this allows me to stay easily hydrated uh, just as well as a hydration reservoir or bladder uh, because I can drink all the time without having to reach back and grab a bottle. It's just right there. And this uh, integral carabiner here uh, it doesn't look like it would be all that sturdy, but I've never had one of these fails, and I've been using these for years now. Uh, this is now my go-to water carrying system, which in Arizona is uh, an important thing here. Water is life in Arizona. And uh, so the Platypus uh, soft-sided water bottle with integrated carabiner that clips onto the shoulder harness of my ULA pack. Next up is Aquamira, which is uh, what I use for water purification. You mix these two together inside this little cap here. Uh, you put uh, seven drops of part A, seven drops of part B. Let it sit for five minutes until it turns yellow, and then you dump that into uh, a liter of water. What I like about using Aquamira is it's tiny. This is a fraction of the size of uh, most water filters. Um, they're extremely lightweight. This stuff weighs uh, next to nothing. And it is super ultra dependable. The worst thing to have happen to you is to be a couple days out into the wilderness somewhere and have your filter fail on you. Um, and there's nothing you can do about that except uh, carry a spare filter element, um, which is pretty heavy. So uh, what I really like about the Aquamira is that it, it just does not fail. I mean, it works all the time, any temperature, any time, any water. The downside of this is it does not clarify your water. Uh, here in Arizona, it's not unusual to have to draw water from a cattle tank. And uh, that can be some pretty nasty, slimy green stuff. And this will get rid of the germs um, in it, but it ain't gonna make it taste any better. If you're going into an area where you're gonna have really grungy, slimy, algae-filled water, you gotta carry a filter. And, and I still do carry a filter in some cases, but I, I try to carry the Aquamira. The reason I started using it was trips to the, uh, along the Colorado River in the Grand Canyon. Colorado River water will plug up a filter uh, within uh, a few cc's. Uh, you'll have to, if you're using one of the MSR um, ceramic filters, you'll have to clean the grunge out. Uh, this stuff will work even on Colorado River water, uh, but in that particular case, it's just silt, and if you let it sit for an hour or two, it'll actually sink to the bottom. So I, I bring a little uh, uh, water carrier with me. I let the silt settle out, and then I pour it into uh, one of my uh, uh, platypus bottles, and then I add the Aquamira, and I am good to go. So Aquamira chlorine dioxide. 
Uh, some people claim um, they don't like the taste of the chlorine in the water. Uh, for myself, uh, maybe I just don't have a very good sense of taste, but I don't really taste the chlorine. I don't find it objectionable. Uh, so this, and this is what most of the municipal water supplies use is chlorine dioxide to purify uh, uh, their water. So uh, this is very, very safe to use. So Aquamira chlorine dioxide. So next up is my footwear system. And I've been using this combination for the last five years or so. And uh, I used to have horrible problems with uh, blisters on my feet. I remember hiking the Superior Hiking Trail 10 years ago, uh, getting into camp, uh, lancing my blisters uh, to depressurize them, uh, and uh, just having miserable problems with my feet. But since I've been using uh, this combination of Ultra Lone Peaks, Dirty Girl Gators, and Injinji Toe Socks, I have yet to have a blister. So these are the Injinji Toe Socks, and what these do is they, they encapsulate each of your toes so you don't end up with blisters between your toes, and I used to get a lot of those. Uh, these breathe really, really well and then the shoes breathe really well, and the Dirty Girl Gaiters, which are designed to fit shoes like this, there's a special ring in the Ultra Lone Peaks for the little hook on the front, and then on the back, there's this little uh, Velcro uh, tab here, it's called a Gator Trap, and when you open that up, that mates with the Velcro on the Gator and holds it in place so it doesn't slip off. So uh, you just have these tiny little gators on your feet, or these are not waterproof, by the way. They will keep rainwater <clears throat> from draining directly into your shoes, uh, but they're not going to keep your socks dry. Um, but they will keep dust and dirt out, and they will keep your socks from getting um, just absolutely filthy. Uh, on some of these Arizona trails, like the Grand Canyon, they're they're dusty, they're dirty, and uh, if you don't wear gaiters like this by the end of the day, your socks are just coated with, uh, with red dirt, whereas the gaiters keep the, the dirt out of the shoes and keep your socks reasonably clean, so uh, you won't have to change them so often. So Ultra Lone Peaks, Dirty Girl Gaiters, in gingy toe socks. No more blisters. Next up is my uh, Marmot Precip uh, rain gear. Uh, on most trips I can get by with just the jacket, um, but if I'm in Minnesota or uh, canoeing or backpacking on the Superior Trail, the pants will come with me as well. And these are my original pants that I bought back in 2008. Uh, they don't get a whole lot of use. I used to use them a lot during the winter. These are fantastic for winter camping. Uh, when you're in the snow, sitting in the snow, or uh, uh, you've got snow precipitating down on you, these will these will keep your your legs nice and dry. But uh, most of the time here in Arizona, uh, I just use the jacket. Uh, I had to replace this jacket, I believe, in 2009. I lost it while I was hiking on the uh, on the border route trail, and you can see after 11 years, uh, some of the lining here is starting to wear. Uh, so it's probably time for me to replace uh, this again. Uh, but the Marmot Precip uh, is an incredible value. You can typically get the jacket for $100 or less. Uh, one of the other nice things is similar to uh, uh, the Polar Fleece, the L.L. Bean Polar Fleece, is these come in uh, tall sizes, which is uh, super, or at least they used to the last time I bought them. Uh, so these uh, fit me extremely well but they're a very, very good value. They don't breathe quite as well as some of the high-end waterproof breathable materials, the Gore-Texes and so on. Uh, not quite as breathable. The Precip jacket does have these pit zips, so you can, uh, you can ventilate uh, underneath your, your arms by just unzipping the pit zips here. And that uh, allows you to uh, since there's not a whole lot of water is going to flow underneath your armpits, that you're, you still stay dry. But uh, uh, these have worked out just fine for me for uh, a dozen years. So the Marmot Precip 
rain jacket, and rain pants. Next up is my, uh, my Ursac. And this is my original Ursac I bought in 2008. Uh, when I first started backpacking, I bought uh, one of the, the smaller Bear Vault. And I always had this probably irrational fear that it was going to, uh, a bear or a raccoon was going to push it and it was going to roll down into uh, one of the rivers up along the Superior Trail and float away on me. So I like the idea that the Ursac uh, has this string on top, this indestructible cord that you tie around uh, a tree trunk and then the critters can't move it. This guy is anchored in place uh, for the night. So this is made out of Kevlar. Um, <clears throat> it won't prevent your food from being gnawed on, from being smushed by a bear's jaws, uh, but the whole idea is to keep the food away from the bears and not let the bears actually consume the food, and, and that it will accomplish. The other nice thing about this is um, it's varmint proof. The, uh, the rats and the mice and the, the other critters can't get at your food. Uh, when this is cinched up, uh, that top is really tight. And to be honest with you, uh, it's much more likely when you're backpacking that you're going to have a problem with mice or rats or other varmints of that nature than you are bears. bears bear attacks on, your, on camps, are they certainly happen. Uh, but they're not nearly as common as uh, rodents going after your food. And uh, these things are definitely mouse-proof. So uh, the Ursac, uh, there's all kinds of new models of this out now, uh, but this one has lasted me a dozen years, and uh, I still use it today. Next up is my war bonnet hammock. Uh, and this is uh, one of the very few pieces of gear uh, that I acquired through my gear reviews with Backpack Gear Test uh, um, for, uh, so I didn't actually have to purchase this. And I got this in 2009. It was right around the time when I moved to Tucson. And I have four hammocks. I have two Hennessy's. I have this guy, and then I have uh, uh, another brand of hammock. And I find I always end up going back to this uh, Warbonnet Blackbird hammock. It is the most comfortable of all the hammocks I own. Uh, I really like the integrated foot box. I love the shelf. The shelf allows me to store my electronic equipment at night right near my head and I can just reach it. I can get at my Kindle or my iPhone. I can store if I need to. Uh, uh, my fleece up in the shelf up there if in case I get cold at night. Uh, it's been incredibly reliable. I've never had a problem with the zipper entrance uh, in 11 years. This guy has the uh, webbing suspension uh, with buckles that I use with a Dutch clip to wrap around the tree and attach it to itself. And uh, this has been extremely reliable. It, uh, it's 11 years old now, and uh, you wouldn't know by looking at it other than the fact that it's got a lot of uh, uh, pine pitch on it from uh, hanging on pine trees. I also use with this an Arrowhead Equipment Shangri-La Cat Cut Tarp, and uh, that has also uh, been a, a great piece of gear. Last but not least is my iPhone. Uh, people don't think of an iPhone as being a piece of backpacking gear, um, but it is my GPS. I use it with Gaia GPS. I use it for entertainment at night. I listen to podcasts or music. Um, it is my, my clock. Uh, just by pressing one button at night, I get a nice big display of the time that I can uh, read without putting my reading glasses on. Uh, I've got apps for stars and constellations. Uh, I've got apps for flora and fauna identification. And of course, it's my camera. Um, if you watched my uh, video on the Wee Lassie, uh, you saw this little ultrapod uh, that I've had for over a decade. Uh, this little ultrapod and the camera adapter allows me to put my iPhone in here and then just set this up wherever I need to. And then I can, uh, I can film things. I can film myself 
or I can use this to film time lapses. I use this a lot for time lapse photography, which the iPhone does a great job of. My iPhone has become just an absolutely indispensable piece of backpacking and, and camping gear for me. So uh, right now I'm using an iPhone 11 Pro to uh, record this video and it just has superb quality, image quality uh, for video and stills. So uh, an iPhone for uh, backpacking. That's it. Thanks a lot for watching. I hope you learned something from, uh, from this video. I know I certainly enjoyed taking a look at all the gear that I've been using over the years and reflecting upon it and thinking about what has really um, been the things that have stood the test of time for me. And uh, I hope you find it useful. And if you did, please click like or subscribe down below. And uh, we'll see you on the next video.